All right, everyone, thank you for coming. Good evening. Um, you are here at the Native uh, Kiwana Native Plant Symposium. It's our fourth annual event. So we uh, really appreciate you being here and spending the time with us today. Um, what we'll do is we'll have two presenters um, at tonight's session. Um, we'll have local garden showcase talking about no native plants and stormwater management at the Marquette Food Co-op. Uh, featuring Bill Sanders, and then we'll have native plants and native insects with Dr. Tara Ball. And what we'll do is we'll have time for each of our each of our presenters will present. We'll have some time for Q and A after each of um, each of their presentations, and then um, at the end we'll have some additional time for open discussion as well as an update on uh, the Project Wingspan project with Connie uh, Cranser. And so. Just wanted to again thank you for coming. It's a really uh, nice night out, and but we're still kind of pretty early in the garden thing season, so hopefully it'll be some good inspiration for you. Um, my name is Maria Genoviak. I'm a member of the. I'm a master gardener through Michigan State University Extension and a board member with the Kiwana Land Trust, and I am one of four organizers for this event. So throughout the evening, you might be hearing from our uh, my co-conspirators, Jill Fisher, Marsha Goodrich, and Jeannie DeClerc. They'll also be helping to um, manage the chat, answer questions, and um, provide updates um, between the presentations and at the end of the day. So I wanna thank them for all of their help in putting this on and thank all of you for being here. And so uh, with that, I am going to, um, introduce, uh, I need to get my screen here, but I'm gonna introduce uh, Bill Sanders, who's our first presenter. He's a landscape architect. I'm going to let him uh, maybe introduce himself a little bit and what company he works for so I don't um, mispronounce the name, but um, he's gonna be talking about the um, how the Marquette Food Co-op, when it was working, uh, transitioning from a grocery store and, um, restaurant into its new facility. Um, they really wanted to focus on sustainable development and um, really focused on building some, um, doing some native plant gardens that have a really strong emphasis on stormwater management. So it's gonna be really great. Bill is a licensed landscape architect and has practiced um, as a designer for site and building design projects in the Marquette area since 1983. And he's a principal in the firm of Sanders and Kazapi. Associates and located in downtown Marquette, and their firm specializes in landscape architecture, architecture, and historic preservation. So I'll let you introduce more about yourself, Bill. Um, let you share your slides and um, present to us today. We're really excited to hear about this project. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, Let's see here if I can get this to work. Perfect. Yep, all set, thank you. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so so um, that's uh, uh, when we started our firm in 2011, uh, was it gonna be Chapsky and Sanders or Sanders and Chapsky? So we decided Sanders first because nobody would probably be able to pronounce Chapsky. So uh, Chapsky, that's pronounced anyway, so. Um, well, uh, first I want to thank uh, Maria, you and your uh, co-conspirators for letting me be part of this today. And um, it's it's a uh, it's a cool thing for me. Uh, you know, brought me back to my first Earth Day in 1970 as a 14-year-old kid uh, wandering around a college campus, just uh, thinking that all the events that day were pretty cool. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, so today, well, what I'm going to talk about <clears throat> is a project we did about nine years ago now uh, for the Marquette Food Co-op. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, we, we really appreciated them as a client. Um, you know, as a, a design professional to a degree, we can only do things that our clients will allow us to do. And when the food co-op came to us, uh, to help them design their new facility, um, you know, they, they had uh, sustainability in mind. I mean, they, anybody who knows anything about the co-op is, it's all about sustainability and, uh, you know, natural features and, and those sorts of things. So um, we, we really appreciated 
the latitude they gave us, the encouragement they gave us to try and do some different things. Um, and uh, so we'll talk about those a little bit here uh, as we go through our slides. Um, but the, the neat thing was is that this, this site, as you'll see uh, in a little bit, um, was almost entirely developed, you know, almost entirely impervious surface, um, but it was an existing facility. Uh, they did not have to do all of these sustainable things um, as part of any zoning approvals or, or city engineering approval. They did them all because, because they knew um, that it was the right thing to do. And they really deserve a lot of credit um, for developing a site the way that they did uh, here at the uh, new store. <clears throat> so this is an aerial view of uh, the site about uh, 2012 when we started. And the grocery store site is, you can see it's either roof, asphalt or concrete. There's, there's almost no um, permeable surface on this site. The only thing that's not asphalt is a little chunk of dirt. And I, and I do mean dirt because it was dirt with a few spotted knapweed mixed in um, here in the corner. And then what you can't see in this photo is a large part of this site uh, actually is a very high concrete uh, retaining wall probably 15 feet tall or thereabouts. <clears throat> so what that means is it, it generated a lot of heat onto the site. So you can see this is really a heat island um, on this block uh, with the pavement, um, dark surfaces and, and whatnot. And uh, there, there are some storm water um, um, conveyance features on the site. But this, this particular place is less than a half a mile from Lake Superior. So it doesn't take long for any drop of water to hit the ground and end up in the lake, uh, carrying whatever pollutants with it um, that it picks up along the way. So again, you know, it was really a cool thing that the co-op wanted to do the right thing with this site. And uh, so we'll talk about those here in just a minute. So this slide kind of tells you a little bit about what our goals uh, were on this site. As you saw from the previous slide, um, there's a great deal of impervious surface, um, which means very little pervious surface. And so, so with stormwater um, and, and the use uh, at the site, so, so the co-op's not like a regular grocery store um, with their farm to table um, initiatives and you know, locally produced foods. Um, much of the garden crops and such are processed from the farmer uh, to go on the shelves at the store. So they maybe use a little more water um, for that kind of uh, work than you'd typically see in a regular grocery store. So maybe the use of potable water is a little bit higher than one might expect there. So what we wanted to do um, was address that need as part of the site design. Um, and also to mitigate uh, the impervious surfaces. <clears throat> um, and then also, um, yeah, I'm gonna back up to this last slide here. You can see there's nothing, there's nothing growing along Washington Street here. So wherever there might be uh, plants that pollinators could access, the flight distance is pretty long. So by getting into the middle of the block here with plants that are attractive to pollinators, we can shorten that flight distance. That also was a goal. So the design starts with some schematic uh, work. Um, we, we wanted to do something uh, different with the stormwater. You know, typically <clears throat> in a lot of developments, you'll see detention, retention basins installed uh, to deal with the uh, stormwater runoff. And we really don't like to do that because they end up being just kind of holes in the ground that hold water. So rather than holding water and metering it off to the lake, 
um, we were able to capture about a third of the site, capture that water as a resource and harvest it for later use on the site. Um, that, was a, that was a big part of this project um, to collect all of that water. It, it, it would then be used for irrigation. Um, the plants um, were, were relatively drought tolerant, but at times of the year, even drought tolerant plants need water. So we would use the water for that. And then also for flushing toilets. So um, that way we're not using potable water, which is essentially processed. Uh, we're not using that for those, those functions. <clears throat> oh, the other thing too, yeah. Um, so we started out with that rain harvester but the other thing we wanted to look at on this site was using live sidewalks. And because of the topography, topography of the site and the topography inside the store, um, this back entrance gave us an opportunity to uh, get enough grade distance that we could introduce natural light to the basement and, and have an opportunity to do what I'm calling a live sidewalk. And what I mean by that <clears throat> is what you see in this, this image in the bottom right hand corner. Um, what, what it is is a, a grid basically for the site that replaces the sidewalk surface. And then below that, plants like sedums and things like that can be grown. So you still keep that, that uh, live uh, ground plane, uh, but yet you can still get across it as part of an accessible route. <clears throat> the, the image in the upper corner is the uh, live roof at the uh, American Society of Landscape Architects building in Washington, DC. And the bulk of that surface where you see people standing is actually uh, a grid over live plants. So um, you can really do some cool things with something like that. <clears throat> So you could call it flow through pavement, live sidewalk, you know, those sorts of things. These, these are things, you know, I'm gonna talk about the ideas we had. They didn't all necessarily make it to the built project, but I think it really, it helped us uh, even be able to talk about doing these sorts of things for future work too. So I mentioned earlier that uh, we try to avoid uh, detention, retention, and instead uh, what I like to call bioswale. And uh, we like it especially because number one, it's much more aesthetic. Uh, it provides better uh, pollinator habitat, um, more live plant features. Um, and so, so you're trading this uh, high, high biotic function element with the bioswale for what is a high hydraulically functioning element uh, in a detention retention basin. Maybe not functioning as high as a biotic feature, but hydraulically they do work very well. So, you know, we, <clears throat> we don't need to slow down the stormwater runoff on this site because we're harvesting it and reusing it. So we're, we're able to still get great um, hydraulic uh, improvement on the site without doing detention. And instead we can just do a bioswale like this and then with deep rooted plants uh, serving as conduits to take the stormwater away, um, they, they work, work very well. <clears throat> and the other thing too with uh, the way we handled it with the stormwater features and so on. Um, you know, a lot of times, uh, uh, maybe, maybe as a landscape architect, I'm too, too sensitive to this, but you hear these, you know, that the plants, <clears throat> all the flowering plants is really the fluff on a project. And I, I really don't believe that that's true. I think they're, they have great importance to people. Um, you know, beautiful things make people feel better about uh, their world and everything they do. So, and, and not only that, um, there's been a lot of research that uh, attractive surroundings 
um, may result in people spending more money when they're in the store. So that, that works good too. <clears throat> Excuse me for this frog in my throat here. <clears> throat> so <clears throat> this, this isn't the plant list for the general landscape on the site, but it is the list for the, the bioswale that we have. And we really uh, work hard to make sure we get as much diversity as we can um, when we plant these things. Um, they're not all gonna make it, you, you know, that's kind of a given. Uh, so the more diversity you have when you start, the more diversity uh, you'll have coming out the other end. The other thing is uh, we'd like to have maybe a, a greater percentage of Forbes um, just, just because of the aesthetic element, but the uh, grasses, sedges, and rushes really do a lot of the heavy lifting uh, in the landscape, so we definitely uh, like to keep plenty of, plenty of those in the mix. So we might spec something like this um, and say, you know, you have to have at least uh, 10 of the forbs and eight of the grasses listed, and that gives the... Um, supplier a lot more latitude because sometimes from year to year, they just don't know how much they're gonna harvest in any particular species. So rather than make it difficult to find these things, we like to give them a little bit, bit of latitude, but then we also will specifically tell them some of these that must be part of the mix. And that's oftentimes just based on our preference and uh, our like of certain plants. The, uh, the other thing about the site, you know, your urban landscape a lot of times requires some turf grass. Um, this project was uh, no different. Um, this image here on the right is uh, Wolfgang Ohm from the firm of Ohm van Sweden from Washington, DC. And those are the guys that really pioneered this new American garden um, uh, idea in the 70s. Uh, so if you get a chance to read any of their work, uh, it's definitely worth that. This is another image uh, where we have, this is not the co-op site, but um, even where we do need to have turf, we also try to keep natural elements in the landscape with the dune grass at this project, uh, which worked pretty good. So this is back to the co-op here and um, one of the things we try to do here is um, keep the bicycle, you know, it's just, it's just all part of the, the philosophy of the co-op. You know, the bikes are parked in front rather than the back 40. Um, we have this uh, trellis element here. So we have uh, big windows going into the deli prep area, but yet we can screen that from solar gain, but they still would get the light. Um, and, and this, this is the place where uh, I really kind of wanted to talk about maybe one of the failures on this site. We tried to do turf here using buffalo grass and we used sprigs uh, spaced uh, a foot or so apart. And that was probably not the way to do that. You know, if I had to do that again, I would probably have it grown as, as sod and placed because um, it really did not, it didn't take, it just, the, the effort to keep it weed free was just too great uh, with starting a new store and, and it essentially did not do very well. We, we did put in the rain harvester, although it's a buried cistern rather than a tower, uh, but that was part of the landscape. And this is where the live sidewalk had intended to go. But as the project developed, it just became more of an effort to put that in than, than really we could uh, sustain as part of the budget. So that ended up falling out of the project. And, and just a little bit about our, our logic in the plantings. <clears throat> we tried to layer the site as much as we can, get as much verticality in as we could. So even though this isn't a native uh, uh, cultivar here of uh, ornamental grass, but it forms a nice backdrop for the bus uh, waiting benches. Um, and then you know, the, we have a number of gardens where you know, just typical garden plants like sunflowers and such could be planted. 
um, which really is kind of a cool feature of a co-op. Uh, this is the front entrance. Uh, again, we tried to keep native plants, uh, you know, up close to the, the entrance um, and keep some seat wall space. I think this is Tio Sinte here. That first year we had sourced some seeds for that, which is a, a corn precursor, I guess you could call it, uh, which is kind of cool um, on the site. And this is the bioswale. And uh, one of the things we did with this, we, we knew um, the, the end of construction was gonna be late in the season. Um, this was a really important element to get uh, vegetated quickly because there would be a lot of stormwater moving through that. So we actually had this grown as a sod uh, at the land with the landscaper. They grow it in uh, core fabric and deliver it to the site. It's super, super heavy. Um, but man, this stuff took off like one day it wasn't there and the next day it was like this. It was really, really successful. I encourage people um, to, to uh, do projects like that. So we do have uh, some oak trees in the bioswale too. Um, and again, this is just to take that first inch of water. Um, and most of the pollutants are in that first, first inch of rainfall as it runs off a of site. So we're, we're treating that with the bioswale and then you know anything over that would flow off the site. But again, we are collecting uh, water and harvesting it for uh, use as well. One of the other things since, you know, the whole block almost is paved um, is the stormwater runoff patterns uh, across borders, across property lines, essentially. So trying to control uh, vehicle traffic from our site and the neighbor's site was pretty problematic. Uh, snow plowing in the wintertime, fencing would get crushed. It, it just was, was not really an effective way to do that. But we did use, um, some ornamental grass here, and that really seems to work quite well uh, for uh, controlling traffic. And uh, it certainly stands up great for uh, snow plowing and such. And this is how we dealt with that big uh, heat beast with the retaining wall. Um, we did put in quite an elaborate system of uh, uh, trellis uh, uh, structure not on all of the wall, some of the wall we planted um, uh, Virginia creeper, which would uh, adhere on its own, but we wanted to be able to grow things like uh, birdhouse gourds and, you know, ornamental garden kind of plants uh, to screen the wall. So uh, that worked, the, the, the structure works well. I don't know how, um, how much it's used at this point, but uh, anyway, that's a good way to, to cover that wall. So this uh, one thing I wanted to leave you with, uh, as I was putting this together, um, you know, being a landscape architect, you know, they, we have this annual annual landscape architect month. It's a world event, um, but I put up the uh, uh, address for ASLA.org. That's the American Society of Landscape Architects, and a couple of links down at the bottom of the slide. They have a really a wealth of uh, papers and documentation and, and uh, articles dealing with native plants. And one of them that is especially interesting, and Dr. Ball will probably talk about this as well. Uh, the bottom link um, talks about uh, native ours. You know, so as they're starting to um, uh, build cultivars from native plants, maybe they're not so good uh, for pollinators and such. So something to kind of keep an eye on um, when you're buying native plants, just to be sure that they still function uh, in the environment for pollinators and such. So that's the last slide I had. I didn't realize it would be this hard to uh, breeze through these in less than 25 minutes. So. We do have a couple of questions. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you, Bill. And that, pictures are always just amazing um, to just be able to see this. 
Um, I one question was regarding the plants. Um, excuse me, the grasses that you use. And so I'm wondering if you can um, flip backwards to the, and we can just kind of as we take Q and A, people can enter their questions in the chat. If we flip back to your uh, plant list there, and then that question came in when you were talking about the grass mix um, for the um, swale grown in in core. So. I, if you could just repeat that part, that I think that was where the, what generated the question. Yeah, so so we had the option of seeding, placing seed in the bioswale, or we could buy plants, plugs, quart plants, whatever size, and plant them all. Or the the uh, uh, nursery that we worked with, Agricol, uh, I believe they're in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, gave us the option. It, actually, we initially started talking to them about growing, you know, custom growing sod with the buffalo grass. And that conversation evolved into the bioswale. And they said they could grow that as well for us uh, as a sod. And just because of the timing of the project, you know, we couldn't plant until fairly late in the season when we wouldn't really get very good success. So by having them plant the uh, bioswale in this core fabric um, in essentially in the spring, grow it all summer and then plop it on the ground when we needed it, we were able to get basically instant results and uh, good root, root take, it, was, it really worked well. I, I think you're muted, Maria, or I can't hear you anyway. No, I was. Thank you yeah. so much. Um, one of the questions kind of building on that one, we had two more questions come in. Um, one of them is is how much was that the difference in cost with that seeded core method versus, you know, um, other methods, like maybe if you were doing plugs or seeding or... <sighs> I, I don't recall the exact cost. It was mm -hmm. more money uh, to do uh, do the sod, the, the um, bioswale sod, but not a lot more. You know, when you really consider, you know, they were growing them from seed or very small uh, seedlings. So the cost of the material was lower for the grower than it would have been for us to buy them as, you know, cork plants or so on, plus the labor here on this end. It, it might have been a little more, but it wasn't a lot more. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Jill, where did you come, you came off mute. Did you have a question or want to add something? Uh, no, I was going to jump in there when you were on mute. <laughs> oh, gotcha. I was, I was just going to get to the shade question. There. Go for it. Uh, there is a question about plants in particular, including grasses that are best for shade. Uh, that are good for shade. Um, well, a real good grass substitute would be uh, Pennsylvania sedge. We like that quite a bit. Um, that, that would really be a good shade grass substitute, I would call it, as far as just grass, like lawn grass. You know, fescues are good in the shade, um, but, uh, you know, most of those that you're going to find are, are not going to be native, although I think sheep fescue or a variety of that is native. A little harder to establish than things like uh, uh, bluegrass and such, but definitely worth the effort. Great. And there was a clear on a kind of clarification on the, the earlier grass question about the ornamental grass types used in the front of the um, in the front by the part, um, I think, of the building by the benches. Yeah, yeah, that, that is, uh, is known in the trade as Carl Forster grass. Uh, it's a Calamagrostis acutifolia, um, which is, to my knowledge, not, not a native, um, but uh, that works quite well. And then the grass we use between the parking lots is native, although it's, I guess, what I'd call a native R. It's uh, uh, switchgrass, essentially heavy metal grass. Um, Panicum Brigadum Heavy Metal, I think is the name. 
Great. All right. Well, I think we, uh, there's a few other comments in the chat, but I think we got most of the questions. So um, thank you uh, so much. What we'll do is um, people did ask, we will be, we did, we are recording um, these presentations. They will be posted available um, on our website. I think when all the, when all of the talks are done next week, we'll post them all at once. And so they'll be up um, at the beginning of May. And yeah, Bill, do you want to send us out with this? Any final comments with this wonderful picture and quote? Yeah, this is, this is one of my favorites. Um, um, yeah, no, I think, I think I just really appreciate all you folks are doing uh, there in the Keweenaw with um, promoting native plants and a healthy environment. So good job. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Bill. We have um, another... A presentation, but we want to give people a chance if you need to step away and stretch um, your legs, grab a glass of water. What we're going to do is a few updates. Um, um, and so what I'm going to do is first ask, um, let's see here, I think Marsha Goodrich to talk a little bit about some of the work that's happening with q on Wild Ones. We'll see um, there might be some other updates from the different organizations who are help, helping to co-host this event. Um, we'll have um, just fill a few minutes here with uh, that. I would also encourage people, um, if you're hanging out with us, I forgot to ask at the beginning, chat in where your gardening is, you know, where your garden is or where you live, or, you know, maybe a fun project you have planned um, for this upcoming growing season. We'd love to see some um, activity in the chat. I'm gonna have um, Marsha give some updates on wild ones. Um, we'll have then, uh, and then we'll hear a, a short update too on Project Wingspan at the end, um, along with some additional Q&A time. So Marsha, you're up next. You're on mute. All right. Um, well, probably the thing that people would be most interested in is we are going to be having a, our plant sale again this year. Um, we, we do have some shade plants, but we, they're in such limited supply that they will probably all be bought up by our members. So if you really want to, to buy some sh shade plants from us, um, I suggest you join. <laughs> you, can, um, you can find out more about us at kiwana.wildones.org. Um, other, we're also having a sale or, or two later in the summer. Our first one is tentatively set for June 19th. It will be primarily online and we will let people know about it through the usual outlets. So what else are we up to? Well, we just got a grant from the UP Environmental Coalition to put a native garden or, you know, uh, native planting along Tezcuco Street above Porvu something that will benefit pollinators and people walking by. Um, we are looking at participating in some of the farmers markets that are coming up. And our group is going to be going on a wildflower walk with Nancy Leonard a little later in May. And if you'd like to join that, it would be great if you joined our chapter. There's probably other things that we're doing now that I have slipped my mind. Have I forgotten anything, guys? Well, we may, and we will, we hopefully will be participating in Project Wingspan, which you will hear about later. I had a question, I put it on chat. Um, I belong to a garden club in uh, Wisconsin and also one down here in Iron Mountain. And the Master Gardeners in, in uh, Florence, Wisconsin, they sent out this information about uh, Wee Bee, it's Wisconsin Bee. And they do a bee count. I think it runs all summer. And oh, I was neat. just asking whether there's something similar like that in the UP. I have not heard of such a thing. This sounds like a good idea. You're supposed to just Would find a lovely. plot, mm -hmm. plot of land. Well, in Wisconsin, I'm, I'm I'm not sure it's, if it's through Master Gardeners or what it, what it's through, or the extension. But you can take your plot of land and you you watch the bees and count them over I don't know a six day period or something like that. 
sounds like a good idea to find out just what what species we have here and also well identifying bees is not a super easy thing to do no they have a whole thing on their website mm -hmm. <laughs> and then but just you to appreciate find out what plants uh -huh. find out what plants uh really attract them and such so mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, if anyone else knows about that, this sounds like a great community science experiment and project. Mm -hmm. So chat it in or let Marcia know. Yeah. Um, I if don't anybody know if anything, really, I don't know if anything UP specific, but there's lots of citizen science bee watch. And um, I was going to mention a bumblebee specific one in a little bit here. Um, and then there's there is a couple of bee labs down at MSU and that do count Michigan bees. I don't know if they have anything UP specific though, but that's a good question to delve even further into and find more about. Thanks for bringing that up. Great. Mary. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's good for updates. Um, if there's nothing else from the other organizers, I think we can turn it over to Jill to introduce Tara. Sure. It's my pleasure to introduce Tara. Um, Tara is an assistant professor of forest health at Michigan Tech's College of Forest Resources and Environmental Science. Uh, forest health is a multidimensional uh, area to, to study because you have to keep in mind many things at once. Many things go into the health of our forests. And the health of our forests, of course, determine uh, what we can get out of our forests. So it's a really important subject. You have to look at the entomology and what's going on in the insects, the pathology, uh, invasive species, the nutrients which affect the forest growth, the anthropogenic changes, which, uh, you know, all the things that we humans have done to our forests throughout uh, our long and short history. And then now we have climate change as well. So that's many things that affect the health of our forests. So it's a multidimensional uh, topic. And uh, Tara is full of all kinds of information on that, as well as Tara is a raiser of things. She raises flowers, she raises vegetables, she raises chickens, she raises bees. She raises human children as well on top of all of that. And uh, she's really good at foraging and she's also has an extensive use of um, ethnic uses of native plants. So there's so much in Tara's head that I'm so pleased that she agreed to share some of it with us tonight. So with that, Tara. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Jill and the rest of everybody for inviting me to talk tonight. Um, this is a topic that I don't often get to to just be super excited about and talk about my favorite plants and gardens and my favorite insects and the bugs that I find outside. I often have to put my teacher hat on and, and talk about the pests and how we manage them. So if I sound really excited or I'm talking really fast, it's because that I just feel like I could share so much with so many of you tonight. Um, but do feel free to type uh, lots of questions into the chat box. Hopefully I, if I see them pop up, I'll be able to answer them while I'm talking um, rather than having to wait till all the way at the end. Um, but I'm glad that Maria and Jill and they're, they're recording this and they can post it. I'm really happy. I have a bunch of reference book pictures of book covers, which I think it's always easier to find a book by the cover than just the name of it. Like looking at Amazon or something. Um, pictures like that, if you have questions you want me to send you afterwards, I've got my email attached as well to this. Um, and I also just wanted to say thank you. And I feel it's so appropriate to be able to share this all with you on Earth Day. So it's kind of really exciting to get to talk about um, over an overall theme for everything that I'm gonna cover as kind of split in half between plants and insects. But I really feel that if something's not eating your plants, which as gardeners and people raising things for food and stuff like that, it's like, oh, we kind of don't like that right away. But it really means in your garden is not part of that natural ecosystem that we're all kind of borrowing some space from. So it is really important to allow some of that to be happening. And of course, you kind of want to watch and if um, critters are, are bullying us, if they're taking up too much of that space back and not sharing things with us, then we might want to manage them. But for a lot of the gardening things that I do, um, kind of let what happens happens. You know, every single year you have a garden, everybody on the call tonight um, knows that whenever you garden, it's, it's an experiment. We're kind of just waiting to see what happens happens and um, trying to learn our best from that. So um, 
it's on my kind of list of things to do this summer to make a sign like this for myself. Um, I want to have as a good reminder in my own backyard. Let's see if I make that share here. So I kind of split this in half. I was going to talk a little bit about some native plant considerations and, and talking with Jill about what to cover. It's really hard. I could talk about any one of slide and expand it into a full hour. Um, and I'm going to like do three bullet points for so many of these topics, but um, it's kind of everything from the more things that we think about when we're talking about having insects in our gardens and the flowers and the forage that they have, but also the shelter and nesting substrate can be really important. Um, in addition to just some other easy DIY yard or garden habitat things that we could do to promote more insects in our in our areas. And then I really want to just do a quick survey of some really recognizable insect orders that really benefit from native plants in our gardens and um, things that maybe we don't really think about being good species or things that we like to have around, but kind of challenge some of our perceptions of insects. Many of them get a really bad rep, right? And so I've just got as a quick example here, no one's gonna argue with you that butterflies are bad bugs. We all want butterflies in our gardens, right? But if you see something that's eating the leaves of some of the flowers that you planted, or I see them in the my little herb garden eating the sage every summer, and they're kind of this spiny caterpillar, I'd be like, oh, I don't want that around. I gotta pick them all off or flick them out of there because I'm worried they might be poisonous or something. But this is the exact same species. These are both um, painted ladies or American butterflies, and this is the caterpillar. It's even though it's the exact same thing, we often kind of think of, you know, gross caterpillars as the bad bugs. We don't want those, but it's kind of the chicken and the egg thing. You kind of need to have both of them and support habitat for both of them if you want to see them around. So the most thing that I have to manage in my own gardens are, are my dogs and my kids eating everything. <laughs> That's, um, they're definitely a part of my garden ecosystem. Um, I grow lots of different things and in addition that for food, in addition to native plants that I like to have, I have mostly a woodland area with just a few spots of sun. So where I can, I, I try to, to put as many plants nearby each other, but I don't do a whole lot of cleaning things up. I leave it kind of messy and weedy and lots of um, kind of other stuff around in the ground and stuff like that. But I think that that really does help bring in so many of the insects that my, me and my family enjoy finding all season long, right? And so um, that's just the my gratuitous garden picture that yes, I have gardens at home. Um, it's very much feels like I'm preaching to the choir if I have to share with everyone tonight and talk about the um, benefits of native plants and kind of the, the limitations to non-native and invasive species plants. I don't want to talk too much about that or spend too much time on it because you've probably heard it over and over again that our non-native invasive plant species are, are not the best things for the wildlife, for the habitat, and um, across regions. Um, there's many of our native place species are actually invasive in other areas, right? So it kind of can go both ways. But beyond just creating this overall loss of habitat, they really reduce that native food and cover, both in quantity, the amount of it, and the quality, so the chemistry of the food, and just the diversity of options that are there. But when it comes to insects, non-native plant species, it's been calculated out that they can average about 68% less food on a landscape for insects than when you have native plants present. And that has ramifications up the food chain. It's not just the insects that are there, but everything that eats insects to the, the larger animals and our game species to predators. So it really does impact entire ecosystems when you have non-native um, invasive species that are um, dominant on an area. Beyond that, you get even more impacts. So many of our non-native and invasive plants um, start shifting more things than just the actual habitat itself. And this kind of um, figures is from a paper, I've got the reference down here that kind of summarizes it not only changes just the physical habitat, but um, 
wildlife behavior and communication and reproduction success, where they're able to build their nests at. Um, and that has implications uh, environmentally, as far as on a, across the landscape, where things are present, but in the how, how the ecosystems function and how they work as well. So you start um, seeing ecological traps being sprung. You start seeing shifts in biodiversity and pollination processes and those ecosystem services that so many things we take for granted that are just occurring around us in nature. And all the way up to, we know that there's direct relationship between invasive plants and spreads of human diseases and um, disease transmission between in insects and other invertebrates. So there's a lot of things that happen when we have or promote more non-native plants in our landscapes. So I just said the word ecological traps and I kind of figured that that's something that maybe most people aren't as familiar with. Um, you've probably know and heard of both Amir honeysuckle and plantain. These are kind of considered um, whether they're considered invasive or not the plantain, but they're both exotic species. And the Amir honeysuckle, when it comes to birds, there's some really interesting research out there when robins and cardinals um, actually build their nests in honeysuckle dominated forests or landscapes that they get preyed upon more often. So they're easier to spy or they're closer to the ground. Something about um, nesting in honeysuckle means that they do not have as many fledglings over the season. Um, in addition to that, the berries from the honeysuckle, the fruit is actually really high or in different type of carotenoids. The, the chemistry of the fruit is different and actually shifts the colors of some of the birds that eat those fruit. Um, so you have brighter color plumage in cardinals, you get orange tail feathers instead of yellow in cedar wax wings. And for a lot of species, the brighter the feathers actually indicates that something's sick with that bird and so they're less likely to mate and so it's shifting some of the genetics and the populations of birds and so that is a, a trap that's kind of they're falling into because of honeysuckle present on the landscape. Um, there's lots of examples of that as well with insects and so the most classic one um, with uh, a butterfly that's um, a really common butterfly out west species. Well, it used to be really common. It was Edith's checker spot. Um, it was uh, on this host plant that kind of got shifted out because of cattle and it actually was okay for a time because it shifted to plantain as its host species and all the caterpillars loved it. The plantain stayed green longer during the season um, and it actually started to depend on that and prefer the plantain. But uh, once um, cattle ranching kind of dried up in certain areas because of drought or because they were trying to do the right thing and do some restoration, um, grasses came in and, and covered over the plantain and it killed and literally locally extirpated or wiped out checker spot across whole regions because um, it was literally like a trap being sprung on this uh, species. So when we're talking about insect habitat, native plants for insects or things, and we start um, listing out plant species and we start um, putting our own preferences and biases on things as what we like or we don't like or what we think insects might like or don't like, well really just like um, I talk to a lot of forestry students who are managing forests when we're talking about gardens, we're managing sort of mini forests and mini habitats and landscapes on a small uh, scale. Um, there's not a whole lot of which habitat is better comparisons that you can make because it might all depend on where you are and what your goals are. So you could um, see lots of different types of insects in both of these habitats, depending on what you're interested in. You might see more flying pollinators in the open grown flowering plants. You might see more soil invertebrates or insects that are overwintering or looking for shelter and protection and like that, that pile of pallets. Right. Um, you also have a site here that's from New York and another site that's actually the UK. So that English ivy in the background is not necessarily an exotic plant. Right. And so what you're trying to promote um, can actually depend and, and di dictate what type of habitat you're trying to create. Right. 
I don't think I have to really go much further into that to say that not all habitats are created equal. Um, we just simply cannot manage one area for all insects or all species all the time. Anything we do is going to promote some and limit some other ones. Uh, what you generally see is talking about like pollinators, for instance, or groups, big groups of insects that we're assuming if we bring in a diversity of flowering plants, we're going to have a diversity of herbivores eating those plants as well. We're going to have a diversity of predators that are being attracted to those other things. And so it's kind of when we're talking about pollinators, we don't really just mean just bees or just butterflies. We really mean a whole community of insects that we're trying to bring in. And by managing um, or trying to promote diversity, we can um, have more different species that follow that diversity. And with insects, it can be really tricky because um, to manage for any one thing in particular, because a lot of them, the juveniles or the, the larvae and the adults might feed on completely different things. Since I'm kind of partial to, I work in a forestry department, I live in the woods, um, probably many of you have woods and trees in your area. If you're in the UP, we're, we're in a woodland habitat, right? Yes, we have some open wetland areas and open seral places and, and some prairie kind of coming into the bottom of the UP, but we really do, um, can't knock the importance of the trees and the shrubs around our area that are food and shelter to number of native um, insect species. And it's not just things that bloom in the summertime, but the early spring and the later fall are also really important. And I kind of really like this NRCS poster that's trees for bees. It does have um, different species from all around the US kind of, because it's a, a national um, agency. But the um, I like how uh, aesthetic it is and how it just shows that there are a lot of trees that have really nice, big, showy flowers. Um, that can be beneficial to many different types of bee species. Some really important trees locally are those early season flower sources. I was just watching honeybees in my own backyard today flying up and around in the red maples that somehow you know, the flowers have survived all that snow that we got earlier this week. So the maples, the cherries, even the willow that has those first tiny little flowers and they don't even look like flowers. It's just that first tiny little bud break um, can be really important for a lot of our uh, native bee species as well, as well as um, the butterflies that overwinter as adults. There's even a honeybee in a sap bucket. They're, they're coming even before the snow is all the way gone. If it's a little bit of a warm day, you might see a lot of these really early spring species out and about. Um, as soon as they're done with the, the tree flowers, then they shift onto those spring ephemerals right away before anything else is blooming. So one of the things that um, Bill just mentioned a little bit ago about native Vars and how some of those might be coming about, this kind of ties into that. If we really have to remember that for our native insects, they evolved with native plants. And the more further you deviate away from that, the, the less quality, the less opportunist um, that you're gonna have uh, opportunities for those insects to do well. I really like this, this chart here and I'll walk you through it for in a second, but um, it comes from uh, MSU researcher at Wood in 2018 published this. What I like about it is it's Michigan specific and um, really they surveyed a lot of different species. species. 181 wild bees were um, captured in their uh, survey and they were looking at the pollen that they were bringing in and the solitary bees, we have over 400 bees in Michigan. So this is just a, a small sample of them. But um, you can see throughout the season, the plants that they're on, I've put the common names of a lot of the species rather than the, the Latin scientific names here, it does shift across the season. So early in April, they're on the maple, the cherry, the willow, those some of those really important ones I just mentioned. And then you have the things that are blooming in the summer, the cone flowers and bee balms, and then the late flowering golden rods become a lot more important. So you really see that they're shifting along a gradient of different species. Many of them are, are native groups, native um, species here, whereas managed honeybees, 
So I think of honeybees as a domesticated species, kind of like chickens, right? They're providing us some ecosystem service by doing some pollination, but they're also providing us a food. So a sugar resource that we wouldn't have available to us otherwise. Um, but if you look at in the same areas that these other wild bees were captured from, the plants pollen that they were bringing back was from domesticated crops or from a lot of exotic species that probably evolved with them in their native ranges, right, that are now here as well. So those plant species preferences for native insects really are on those, those native plants, right? We kind of shift away from bees and talk about Lepidoptera, so our moths and butterflies. And I have a couple of things here, some herbaceous plants. These are the top herbaceous plants that support different uh, moths or butterflies. And of course you have goldenrods and asters, sunflowers, some really big plant families here. But looking um, at Calamy and Shropshire, I saw someone put in um, the homegrown nationalpark.org, that's Doug Talamy, the entomologist who really, really um, is talks about the importance of native plants. Uh, they looked at the number of total richness, the number of species of Lepidoptera, all of moths and butterflies that um, depend on these plants for survival essentially, and started ranking them. Like what are, trying to figure out what are the most important plants, native plants to have on the landscape. And what surprised a lot of people was the number one important plant for moths and butterflies were oak. Quercus, and then you see cherries and willows, poplars, lots of woodland plants and lots of shrubs start coming into this as well. Um, this of course is like mid-Atlantic region and um, is, you know, they don't exactly say if it is 100% dependent on it or they just are primarily dependent on it. Of course, many butterflies will go onto multiple plant hosts. They're not only on just one exact thing. So lots of different species here, but it just kind of hits home again. A lot of our native woodland species are probably more important than we think they are sometimes when we're so used to just driving around and seeing maples everywhere, um, right? It kind of gets oversaturated with maples, but they really are important for a lot of different things. Um, if anybody recognizes this uh, butterfly here, you can type it into the chat box. I have a couple other questions built into this throughout the time or go ahead and, and, and interrupt me. But um, if you do recognize this one, this, this is one of my favorite butterflies. It's one of the first ones. I've already seen a couple of them this year. It's one of the few that overwinters as an adult. It kind of hides in bark crevices or sometimes in your garage, you might see it. Yeah, a morning cloak butterfly. And um, they're actually, they can be an occasional pollinator, but they really like tree sap. It's one of their favorite things. The caterpillars for morning cloaks, we don't see them as often in their gardens because they're on up in the canopies of elms and poplars and things. And sometimes it's called the spiny elm caterpillar. Um, but this is a native species and it, and it does like a lot of these tree plants that are listed in this um, uh, list here by Talamy and Shropshire. I really, um, my kids get a big kick out of this, but I think of caterpillars as nature's hot dog. It's um, one caterpillar is, you know, more energy than 20 or 30 aphids. If you wanted to think about it that way, it's really easy to take a soft body caterpillar and kind of put it into your chick's mouth. If you're a bird that's got a bunch of fledglings compared to a whole bunch of other small, tiny insects and things like that, they're nice and juicy. Um, most of the caterpillars that we encounter are moths. There's over 160,000 species of moths and just some of them are butterflies. There's only about 17,000 species of butterflies, just to put them in perspective. Um, when you look at the number of caterpillars it takes to rear birds, it's mind boggling really quickly. Between 60 and 75% of breeding birds in the Midwest depend on caterpillars for a large section of their diet. The next most important invertebrate are spiders, actually insect predators. Um, but when you think about 
uh, just a single clutch of chickadees as they're fledging, they might eat 9,000 caterpillars in one season. And to start doing the calculations for, okay, well, how many chickadees are in the woods or how many bird species in general are in your back woodlot? How many caterpillars does that mean? There's some needing to be supported there in order to raise these families. It can, um, you all of a sudden seems like you might be feeling like caterpillars are raining down around you. Um, is how important they can be. Right. Some other plants to consider besides just the, the foliage or the flowers are um, things that might bloom earlier or later than average. The things that are highlighted here are those shrubs and canes. So the things that have maybe a hollow or a pithy stem. So I think really importantly about elderberry, sumac, raspberries, and leaving a lot of those stems in your garden. And you probably have seen the um, don't rake or even right now, it's really not, early too late enough or not really ready for gardening time we want to kind of leave the stuff that's still overwintering in the, in the leftover parts of our gardens from last year time to emerge because a lot of it might even be in plant stems right um, a lot of our solitary bee species plus many other insects are nesting in those hollow or pithy stems and you've got um, multiple species of like uh, shrubs and canes, but also some of our herbaceous plants do this and they get a little, just a little bit larger and have that hollowness there. That's, this is really one of those reasons why um, we don't want to cut or start raking and pulling down and breaking out um, our gardens yet, just yet, because many of these are still emerging um, or they're starting to come out in the next few weeks here. Really, uh, you can try to kind of supplement this a little bit and um, it's kind of all the rage in the last few years as you've probably seen them and probably many of you have them. Some of these bee hotels in our gardens, you can um, find them at hardware stores or craft stores and lots of instructions exist online to build your own, whether it's just drilling holes in a, in a log or maybe using canes or straws or cardboard tubes and stuff like that. You can find a lot of different ways to support not just solitary bees, but many other insects might use these. Um, they're all trying to sort of emulate natural cavities that would occur in nature. So you have um, wood boring insect holes as they emerge from stumps of wood. Carpenter bees leave these really nice circle, circular holes and then other bees might use them later on. Um, a lot of insects even nest in the ground and so um, they're not necessarily going to those bee hotels but if they're built up or on banks a little bit they might be using that kind of a similar thing. Uh, some some tips for bee hotels, I, get, I do get asked about these a lot and kind of depending on what you look at online, some people really love them and some people absolutely detest them. I have one myself though, I, I really think it's um, nice and important to be able to watch and see some of the um, activity of our solitary bees that we don't necessarily see all the time because they're in our woods and not right where we are. Uh, so I would just make sure that you secure it on a post or have it somewhere. It's not going to be moved around or bumped and, and dislodge any of the eggs of and that are inside of it or anything. Um, the biggest issue that people have about them is they do tend to become uh, magnets for parasites and diseases, any communal living that can happen, right? You have this poor little girl peers covered in, in mites on the back, but um, a lot of those are naturally occurring too. You can try to clean it or scrub it out or recycle out those canes and straws annually after things have emerged from it. You might need to protect it from birds. Sometimes they learn, hey, there's a lot of activity going here, get from free meal. Um, so it, overall, just don't try to jam pack lots of these together, go small, if you're unsure, kind of watch what happens after a year and build from that, or just continue to let your yard plants stay messy and you'll see some of these around just as you would if you had um, a bunch of these bee hotels lined up. Some other plants, just a, a last reiteration of, of plant lists here. Um, you can also select plants that attract insect predators. So they are that important component of biological control and help keep some of our pests in check. Like um, I just 
waxed on the uh, uh, importance of caterpillars, but we tend to not like a whole lot of them in our cabbages, for instance. So we need some of these um, predators around to help keep those populations in balance. And of course, there's lots of lists of, of annuals and perennial garden plants, but the most important ones are the plants that produce these extra floral nectaries. And so there's a whole list of them here. I highlighted many of them that I also have already talked about because of their flowers or hollow stems and things They can become important. But plants that have extra floral nectar, um, they can be these small little glands like this um, yellow jacket is, uh, you can see he's actually um, feeding from that, she is feeding from that gland. And what it, it, they're doing, they can be on the leaves or the stipules or petioles, anywhere really on the plant is putting just a tiny amount of nectar there. And for the insects that are maybe walking up and down the plant stem, it's sort of a refreshment or an extra incentive to stay on this plant and help protect it from caterpillars and aphids and scales and things like that. Um, so there's over 2000 species that have been reported with these um, extra floral nectaries. And so if you select plants that are known to have those, then you just are kind of doing double duty and promoting insect predators as form of your natural control. There's lots and lots of other sort of do-it-yourself, home improvement, backyard garden improvement, things that you can do specifically for insect habitat to promote either pollinators or overwintering places. Um, there's these are bumblebee nest houses and you can find the instructions to make those online or I could send them to you. There's um, just having a compost pile, leaving some areas wild, leaving leaves and that messiness part of your garden in an area allows for a lot of things to overwinter, to find shelter, um, small insect waterers. You can even, um, I've seen butterfly feeders available, instructions for those kinds of things. So you can do lots to bring and promote insects in your, your backyards and gardens. Um, but of course, depending on what you actually specifically want to attract, you can find even more specifics, like there's tons of pollinator references, but you can find things about um, promoting beetles specifically, or attracting those beneficial bugs, attracting predators specifically. Lots of this stuff is available online. You just have to start digging into it to find um, the specific plants that you want for specific insects. Maybe uh, you might be thinking about any, I don't have the space, I don't have the room to do all these things. We just um, looked at or, uh, really tiny gardens on these sidewalk strips and stuff. Any kind of space is better than no space at all for insect habitat. I really like this book. Um, it's called In One Yard, Close to Nature by Warren Hatch. He's a biology teacher and um, he's even gotten a picture of his own backyard there. It really does not look like the ultimate pollinator garden or anything super fancy. Um, really minimal amount of um, money investment went into this. He's got a one sixth of an acre backyard in an urban area, I think in um, the outskirts of, of Portland or something like that in Oregon. But he um, has used uh, his camera and just documented thousands of species of invertebrates in the backyard, right? Um, and so there are this book is kind of like a coffee table book, lots of things in there that are really exciting to look at. Um, there's examples from Portland, obviously, but just the fact that he can find all those with the minimal amount of effort is kind of exciting. And yeah, I do have a lot of Minnesota resources and references on, on many of the pages. Um, some of it is considered native for the Keweenaw. We're probably closer um, ecology wise to Eastern Minnesota than we are to, you know, Lansing and, and stuff out of, of downstate Michigan, but also um, Minnesota DNR has a little bit, in my own opinion, um, a lot stronger presence of pollinators and, and other flowering species online than Michigan DNR. And I don't mean that in any um, bad way. I just, I also have a lot of friends that work for Minnesota. And so I see a lot of their stuff more often, but I think they are um, we're, we're closer in some uh, habitat regards than we are to some of the Michigan reference stuff for downstate. So that's a good question. I was able to check my chat box in the middle here. And then I lost where my clicker was. There we go. 
So um, before I kind of switch over, that's really all I wanted to just really broadly talk about plants, not list specific things, but I want to talk now about more insects. And um, hopefully uh, this is a little bit challenging to our own perceptions and I'm guilty of this too. We all have our biases for insects we like and we don't like or that um, we're attracted to or we, we want to stay away from. And so I kind of want to, um, I have two little kind of guessing games here and I want to say a couple of, of sentences and as I'm going through them, uh, see if you can guess in general what kind of bug, what kind of insect it is that I'm talking about. Not any specific species really, but just, you know, um, if you had to say what kind of, uh, it's a grasshopper or anything like that. See if you can um, think about what I'm uh, talking about here. So this one is evolved to prey on some of the softest, most um, defenseless creatures that are out in our environment. They have very few defenses and they can't do anything if they come across this insect, they're, they're goners, right? This insect has a really slickly armored body and it has literally no predators that um, when it wants to eat, it's gonna eat. And it can eat double its body weight in a single day, it's sometimes described as the wolf of the insect world. It's got a really menacing color pattern. It warns off any predators that it does have. Um, and it has an absolutely rancid, nauseating blood. It tastes horrible. It can bleed on demand when it gets disturbed. Um, yet we really commonly refer to this as one of the only cute insects that we like. And we dress our toddlers up as it and we put it on um, baby Halloween costumes and all kinds of things like that, right? So if you're thinking about it, you're probably so confused right now, but that's a ladybug or a lady beetle. Um, there are about 5,000 different species of ladybugs or lady beetles, whichever word you prefer here. And um, we have tons and tons of native ones that are the, considered that good, that beneficial bug that we like to have in our garden. Some people really detest the invasive lady beetles, the Asian lady beetle, because they um, conglomerate in our uh, um, addicts and places like that, they can sometimes give you a pinch, right? And then they smell bad and they stink. And so people don't really like those ones. But if they don't like that one, then they start to learn that, oh, I don't like any ladybug because it's hard to tell the difference between some of them, right? And so the words that we use to describe insects or those experiences that we have with one, it's really easy for us to kind of put that on all of the different kinds of insects that we come across. So if you think about Asian ladybugs, um, they can be all different kinds of colors and spots. You can't count them and, and use that. You have to just look at the very part of right behind their head at that black and white line. And they have sort of a black M or W, depending on which angle you're looking at. So um, that's just ladybugs, beetles. I got one more like quiz question about some insect species here. I want to see if you can guess what this one is, right? Any bites that you do get from it are not infectious, toxic, or poisonous. They're, they're essentially harmless to humans. They can't do a, a harm to us. Um, they're not really fussy eaters. They will help decompose dead organic matter and consume garden pests. So they can be really helpful as to us as, as good recyclers, right? Um, they actually have really cool engineered ear wings that fold and expand tenfold. And it's been described as defying the laws of origami. Engineers have studied these for um, the biological uh, inspiration that they can uh, give us. And actually one of the most unique things about them is that the females have a maternal behavior that they learn from their mothers. So if they get abandoned, they're actually poor mothers themselves, um, but they stay with their eggs and they stay with their nymphs and they protect them for weeks at a time, which is almost unheard of in the insect world. So you're probably thinking, wow, this sounds like a really cool bug. I wanna know more about what kind of bug this is, right? And if you guessed earwig, then give yourself a round of applause or a pat on the back. Um, I just described one of probably an insect that most people just revile and detest. And when we lift up a potted plant and we see it under there, we're just like, oh, get rid of it and, and kind of push it aside or brush it aside or um, 
try to get them out of there. We do have both native and exotic species in Michigan, and they are really fun to watch. I Once you start learning about them and knowing more about what their ecology is and how they're behaving with our plants, um, they can become pests just like anything that's sort of, you know, not playing along with its role. And I don't like it when they're in my corn plants at all, right? Um, but I know that I can just uh, brush them aside and, and no harm, no foul. So when we're talking about the types of insects to consider, kind of group them into large groups. You have the pollinators, you have natural enemies and the predators, you have the herbivores and the leaf feeders, and then probably the least likely to come to mind are those soil dwelling invertebrates, things like earwigs, right, that are um, down at the ground and either living at the soil surface or dwelling down below the surface. And so um, <laughs> you can find specific plant lists like the MSU extension and all different kinds of places online that say if they're good for pollinators or good for predators or good for soil, all that kind of stuff. And so I'm not gonna go through like specific plant list type things, um, but I just wanna share some, an overview of some of the most easily recognizable things that I know we find in our own gardens and talk about and, and see if um, you're inspired to take a little bit closer look at them as well. So when it comes to bees and we're talking about Hymenoptera using the, the scientific term for all of the types of um, bees and wasps and ants and things like that, I'm really talking about beyond honeybees. Um, honeybees are that non-native species. They're not really, um, would not be here naturally if it wasn't for colonization. So um, Michigan actually has at least 450 different species of bees. And when you start realizing that and you start thinking, well, how many of them do I know? You know, most of us, we could say honeybee and bumblebee and that's it. Um, it's really a struggle to get general public to um, start naming other ones, let alone identifying other ones. But we do have a lot of really cool bees that do the majority of bee pollination much more than and much better than honeybees can do. Um, so I like seeing a lot of our squash bees and the sweat bees, the green guys here that have that real shiny metallic color. Even the longhorn bees, they um, look like just little small little teddy bears. They're really fun to watch. And we actually in Michigan even have um, some pollen specialists that are kind of rare bees. And so um, this is an example of a, a small little bee, uh, Macropis, that is actually a pollen specialist on yellow loosestrife, a wetland plant. So we do have some rare and really special bees in our area. Uh, when it comes to bumblebees, if you're going to get into bees, I really recommend starting with bumblebees. There's only about 20 species of bumblebees, much bigger and easier to see. They're a little bit slower kind of bumbling about, and so they're easier to watch in the state. Um, I think this is a a Minnesota or Iowa uh, bumblebee kind of key, but you can find lots of um, things like this online that are actually uh, really nicely imaged of the coloration on the back of the bumblebee so that you can key it out to species. And it's a lot easier to sort through 20 of them than 450. Um, Bumblebee Watch is a citizen science watch that you can upload just like uh, anything. There's an app for it on your phone and, um, that connects with Xerxes Society, Natural History Museums, and they're kind of mapping out locations of a lot of bumblebee species that many of them are in decline because, and then we know this because of the numbers that are either seen in surveys or that get reported to citizen science projects or that get sent to museum collections, right? So um, the more documented sightings that we can have of them, the better we can understand their presence on landscapes. So um, yeah, thank you, Maria, for putting the link to that into the uh, chat box there. Talking about beyond bees, bees and bumblebees, and um, just wanted to mention the importance of wasps. So another one of those, again, that ugh, you see wasps, you know, a lot of people, the first inclination is to go out and grab that can of raid and get that paper wasp nest out of the eaves. Um, I do that if it's right above the door, right? I've got kids, I don't want them to be um, stung by anything. But for the most part, um, we kind of sit back and watch and see what happens. Um, that can be really exciting to see um, 
a paper wasp bring a caterpillar back into the nest. They're doing a lot of that good biological control for us. They're those natural predators, um, or they may be, if not just literally consuming things. I talk to students, you know, and consider wasps as being the carnivores or the, at least the omnivores of the insect world. Um, sometimes they will eat pollen or nectar as a free source of food right there. Um, whereas bees are really the vegetarians, right? They're just eating plant material. Wasps are eating insect meat, right? So they um, might be laying their eggs in caterpillars or drilling down through wood to lay their eggs on um, wood and tree pests. But for the most part, wasps are our beneficials because they're helping keep everything in check. Right. I saw there was a quick question in the chat box that I think I missed earlier, but I'll come back to that at the end here. Uh, let's see if I can get that to go. And the last Hymenoptera group I need to mention are ants. I really um, debated about throwing these in there or not, but because we watch ants in our backyard so often, I just wanted to, um, you know, help kind of showcase them to everyone else too. They're so important, not only for biological control. Um, there's been evidence that ants are important and, and even eat things like spotted wing drosophila, which is a big pest that's new and recent in our um, raspberries and blueberry crops and things like that. They eat all kinds of grubs and caterpillars, um, but we can watch them as they harvest honeydew, just like farmers. They can move aphids around on plants and, and carry them to new pastures, so to speak. Um, but even when it comes to our native plants, there are some species that are dependent on ants. They need ants to grow. So the bloodroot that's here actually has really special seeds that are attractive to ants. They go and carry that back into their nest and essentially plant the seeds for bloodroot. And that's how that plant species, that spring ephemeral can spread through a forest. Without ants, their seeds are just dropping directly where they are and they're not moving about. And there's a couple other different species that do similar to that. What eats slugs, oh, ants, wasps, oh, if they're eating caterpillars, they'll eat slugs too sometimes, right? That's a, a good question. Some of, we have a lot of exotic species of slugs too. I do not know my slug species very well. I just know that we have both native and exotic ones. Moles do eat slugs for sure. So I only have one slide on Lepidoptera because I talked about them and we're all familiar with butterflies and moths, but maybe not so much with moths. And so just a couple of points. Again, there's a citizen science that's specifically about moths. You can um, find out when moth week is and um, there's you do moth watches, just like there's um, like bird counts at Christmas time for birds. There's, there's moth week when you can report moth species that you have present or take send pictures in of things you don't know. Um, but a lot of our our pest species like the tent caterpillars and stuff are going to turn into moths. This is literally just food for wildlife, right? Lots of bird there um, will feed on these. I've got a lot of kind of wild shrubby cherry and um, aspen right on the edge of our road that's um, really scrubby, right? I'd let the tent caterpillars in that go. They're, I know they're not going to um, crawl down and start eating like my flower garden or my vegetable garden really and get more out of watching the phenology of that and that change, watching birds come, watching um, parasitic wasps come and checking them out. So I, I do enjoy watching um, tent caterpillars. I wouldn't like it so much if they were in my apple trees. I might move them when they're really small still um, before it becomes a big tent. But when they're in sort of the wild areas around, I let them be. Another important uh, caterpillar I wanted to mention, um, that's if you're a gardener, you're probably familiar with horntails. They get a kind of a bad rap because they, um, just this big fat juicy slug, perfect caterpillar if you're a bird, um, that just uh, amazing amount of energy in this thing. But they turn into some of our largest, most desired moth species. Who would not want to have hummingbird moths, these little sphinx moths that fly about in the daytime and often get mistaken for hummingbirds um, in their gardens, right? We love when we have those around and they give us a lot of joy and pleasure to see them. They actually sound like hummingbirds when they buzz our heads. But as a caterpillar, they just, they're a hornworm, right? No one likes 
hornworms in their tomato plant, um, but we have a lot of different species of plants that they can be on and they turn into these really uh, amazing large moths that are, are pretty exciting to see. So um, keeping that kind of in mind of you have to have the, the bad to get the good at the end is important. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go really fast with these next ones. Like I said before, I could have spent an entire hour about on any one of these slides, but I just wanted to showcase some of um, the favorite insect groups that are actually pretty easy to provide habitat for or native plants for in our backyards and gardens. And so with diptera, these are flies and you probably wouldn't think of flies as like a pollinator species, but these specific type of flies, these cerfid flies, or sometimes they're called flower flies or hover flies, they've been estimated as responsible for up to one third of all pollination, which is mind blowing. Um, we have at least 900 species in North America. Most all of them are some type of bee mimic. And you can see a lot of black and yellow on here. Some of them are a little bit more waspy looking. They're even specific bumblebee mimics that are these flies. And you can tell that they're a fly because they only have two wings instead of four and their eyes are much more closer together. Their eyes are always touching in the center of their heads, whereas um, like bees, their eyes are much more on the sides of their heads. Besides all the great pollination they do for us, at least a third of surfid larvae are predators. And so they're attacking aphids and scales. And so they're both pollinators and that predator control for us and helping us out. Yeah, some people call them sweat bees because they do, they land on us and um, oftentimes they, you know, butterflies land the same reason they land on us and they put their, their tongue out, they're getting salt from our skin. They like the, the minerals that we have and they like our flavor a little bit. Uh, beetles. My all time favorite group of insects. I could talk for you know weeks at a time about beetles, but and we just have so many different species in North America. Um, it used to be considered that beetles were the largest group of insects and now we're kind of starting to realize they have some major competition with wasps. There's probably more species of wasps than there are of beetles, but depends on who you ask right. Um, you have beetles forming just about every ecosystem service that there is. There's pollinators and some nectar thieves out there. There's predaceous beetles, there's decomposers and recyclers, there's leaf feeders and the herbivores. So even things that seem kind of as ubiquitous and you know, they don't think of fireflies as doing any great big service in ecology, but the larvae of fireflies are big time uh, predators and help keep things in check. So all of these are important to promote. Um, as far as beetle pollinators, there are uh, quite a few of them and there are some specialist pollinators in, in the beetle species. Um, Beetle flowers tend to be either really big and, and heavy, kind of open bowl shape because beetles are larger bodied insects compared to um, bees or, or surfid flies. Uh, they can overwhelm. So just like other things, sometimes they might be too many of them, right? They're not playing along and, and doing their part when you have too many of any one thing that can be a problem. Um, but I really do enjoy watching them those the the rose chafers and the the beetles that are in our apple blossoms in the spring they seem might seem like well they're eating all of the um the blossoms on the outside but they're actually also pollinating things for us at the same time right you can see all the hairs that they have on their bodies you know that they're um collecting a lot of pollen as they're going along just like bees have a lot of hairs on their bodies um or beetle pollinated flowers might be large clusters of small flowers so that they can land on that umble and that holds up their weight. So there's a, a blister beetle on um, a cluster of goldenrods there. Okay. Other groups, you can't really argue and find too many people who don't like dragonflies or damselflies. Um, we do have uh, over 160 species of them in Michigan, and you can find really good specific um, field guides for these groups. They're again, that natural predator, that natural biocontrol. If you can support any type of wetland area, um, and there are a suite of wetland plants that are important for different dragonfly species. Not only do they like perching on the tall things, right? As you can see in almost all 
the images where people take um, pictures of them here, but there are some dragonflies that lay their eggs inside of native plants and need those types of plants in the area in order to reproduce. So Odonata, you can tell the difference between dragonflies and damselflies. The dragonflies tend to um, rest with their wings out to the side and damselflies have them folded on their back. And they tend to be smaller, but that's not always the case. So size isn't the thing, but at rest, their wing position is the bigger difference. Another group, again, that I really enjoy um, finding and watching and, and seeing active in our garden, in our yard, because not only do I know if I have these, I have a lot of birds that are pretty happy. And um, grasshoppers are such a big part for wildlife, but they're also really great teaching tools. So we're talking about Orthoptera. I'm talking about grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. This is all one group or one order of insects that often get a bad rap where we kind of ignore or every once in a while when we do find katydids, I've, I've had them in my own yard, we have katydids in the UP. Um, they're, they're really exciting to find. You can handle and hold them really easily. Um, they spit out that tar stuff, but it, you know what kind of thing um, gets kids more excited, especially little boys when they have a grasshopper doing that in their hand. Um, but they be, are great teaching tools at talking about metamorphosis. It's, it's pretty fairly simple and easy to find the young nymphs early in the summer that don't have the wing pads yet. So you can talk about this other type of metamorphosis that insects do. You can talk about insect reproduction, the females having the big ovipositors at the back that they're laying their eggs into sandy soils with. Um, and then of course, like songs and communications and insects and the language that insects have. This is the, the perfect gateway species to talk about so many different things that insects do. Right, so um, my boys both have their multiple insect nets all summer long and it's one of their favorite things is to go grasshopper hunting and, and catch as many as they can. Right. Um, another group that's important to sort of recognize are Hemiptera. And so this is a, another one that has that uh, Reputation as sort of being the bad bugs, we don't want them. Who wants stink bugs around? Probably not too many unless people, unless you're a five-year-old boy. Um, but we have over 11,000 different species of hemiptera. This includes cicadas and all kinds of true bugs, plant bugs, leaf hoppers, all kinds of anything that ends with the word bug that is a real bug is in this group. Um, they're differentiated from beetles. by this sort of X wings back rather than a straight line. And they all have that piercing sucking mouth part that many of them can inject into the plants. And that's why we don't like them because they can cause damage to fruits or they can trans transmit diseases to plants sometimes. Um, but there are a number of them that are that biological control. They're using that same mouth part to attack pest insect species and um, eat caterpillars or eat those other soft body things. So again, this is a large group to promote and to have around and allow to be an area because of the amount of pest control that they can do for us and the amount of other wildlife food that they're supporting. Um, some of my favorite bugs are those candy stripe leaf hoppers that are real small to see or the buffalo tree hoppers. They're just so cute kind of walking around. And it's, I, I love that kind of light bulb moment to give people when they ask, you know, what's that spittle bug thing? And finally show them, you just wipe away a little bit of that spit and you see that larvae frog hopper bug on there. And that's like, oh, that's a bug house? I have no idea. Um, that's a really exciting thing to uh, share with people and let them see how that is working in, in it, the ecology of those insects. Right. Um, the last sort of group that again, you could talk an entire session about would be soil dwelling invertebrates, right? So everything else that is living either on the soil surface or in the leaf litter or down below the soil um, has important roles in ecosystem functioning, right? So all your centipedes, millipedes, the roly polies or isopods, the beetles that live in the soil, the that we have native woodland cockroaches, um, the columbula, the springtails, the really, really tiny invertebrates are all super important as, as far as making and supporting that 
biodiverse food chain and food web, the, the very literal bottom of the food web, right? And they're living in amongst the rhizosphere where the roots are, or they might be only going for part of the year's overwintering habitat. But regardless, um, there's a lot of research that shows that native plant leaf litter and the native plants being above the soil um, is so important and uh, really impacts as soon as you have start having non-native plant species, it's changing um, the soil chemistry and the nutrient cycling in the soil and you start losing a lot of these native insects that you wouldn't necessarily think about if you have native plants or not, it would be impacted, but um, it really does all the way down into the soil impact those communities of insect species, what plants are there around it on the top. Right. And so just because I'm talking about insects, I threw these in here as our, our charismatic megafauna. I always get questions when I'm, I'm doing in live and in person groups. Well, do we have walking sticks? We have praying mantises. There are things that people like to have in their gardens, right? Um, we do have one or two species of native walking sticks in the north woods, depending on your definition of North Woods. Um, there's at least four of them here in the, the image here. I've seen them in the UP, I, not in my own yard, but I know we have walking sticks around. They feed on um, native hardwood trees and shrubs, right? And so you can um, uh, promote their habitat by, by leaving our native woodlands, right? We um, do have praying mantises in the UP. Unfortunately, um, neither of them are native species. We have a European and an Asian species, but they can overwinter here. And also because so many people, you can buy praying mantises online or pick them up at sometimes Home Depot or someplace like that and release them in your yard as biocontrol. They're, they're pretty much spread across North America and naturalized in a lot of areas. So um, you can find praying mantises and they're that biocontrol thing. Jill typed in the, the chat box, can I endear centipedes to you? I think of centipedes as those um, helpful predators, right? They're doing biological control for us as well. They're helping eat and small things um, and just continuing that nutrient recycling and decomposition that is important in our soils. And I could find a whole bunch of facts and send them to you, Jill, but I don't wanna go too far off of my, my spiel here. <laughs> Do we have 17 year cicadas? We have cicadas, but we don't have, if you see lots in the news right now, the 17 year cicada brood that's emerging. I get a little bit peeved off when I say, or hear that, oh, they're in Michigan too. And aren't you excited they're in Michigan? Yeah, the, the little bit on the bottom lower bit of Michigan is in the brood, that big brood that's emerging this year. And they're not the same species that are coming out in, in the UP. We do have cicadas, they're, they're here, um, but we don't have those uh, big, huge brews where you basically get millions and bajillions of them that come out all at once. So they're in Michigan, but not this far north. Um, I really cannot recommend enough uh, all different kinds of field guides. And if you're interested in any kind of insect, no matter what it is, you can probably find a specific field guide for that, right? When it comes to birds, it, it's pretty easy to put 500 species of birds into one book where you might see, you know, duck field guides or warbler field guides that go into more depths about um, those specific birds. But for insects, it's, it's literally impossible to just put everything into one book. Um, I really like this Kaufman field guide on the right here. It's what I recommend to my students that um, it's the best kind of overview and it's full pictures on every page, at least to get you to the genre and a, an idea of the species that it could be. Um, but there's moth specific field guides, um, solitary bee specific field guides. There's even those flower flies have their own specific field guides. And so if you're trying to get into and know the exact species of any one thing, you really need to get something that's gonna have a lot more options within it. Um, I even like this tracks and signs book because it has cocoons and spider webs and galleries that beetle makes in wood. And so that's um, another kind of interesting one that's um, 
fun to look at, right? And then of course, on the opposite side, there's tons of reference material for gardens and beneficial garden bugs that we might have or you want to promote. I really like the pollinators of native plants, the blue book that's on here, um, because not only does it list specific plants for woodlands and wetlands and prairies, but it has a detailed list of the plant insect interactions that happen on that specific plant. So if it has specialists and if it has predators of those specialists or anything like that, um, it goes into a lot more detail. And um, I thought about framing this entirely that way, but I wanted it to be a little bit more general than that. Um, but I, I can't recommend that one enough either. So kind of just back at the end here, want to have time for questions. I've been answering some along the ways, but I'm, I'm happy to answer more and, and just keep this conversation going. Um, diversity of habitats is the key, both for that food and shelter. And we can manage for more than just pollinators, right? We also can manage for the things that are eating the leaves, for the things that are in the soil, um, for the predators of all those things that help keep those pests in control. So we don't have to do as much of that control ourselves. You know, optimally, you have a mix of those things around. So you never, I have not sprayed or done any kind of um, really chemical controls at my, this house ever that I, I've lived here for, for six years now. Um, the, I've, I do pick things off by hand, right? But I've never felt the need that um, I had enough of a problem that I needed to do something about it with, with um, sprays. So the more native plants that we have in the area, the more of those native full communities we're able to support. I've got my email on here, but um, Maria or Jill are welcome to have that on the website as well, or um, put that in the chat box. And uh, I just wanna say thanks again for um, having me on here on Earth Day. And I will probably shut my screen, share my screen off so that I can answer any questions. Awesome, Tara, thank you so much, that was great. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Uh, if one or two questions come in, I think we can take them. Tara's been answering questions along, answering questions along the way. Um, and it's, it's getting late and dark out. So, um, yeah, if there's a quick question or two, uh, type it in. I'll, um, while you do that, I'll remind people that we, um, have another native plant symposium, um, series, uh, next week. And so same time, same place kind of. Um, so Sustainable Gardening with Brian Black and The Humane Gardener with Nancy Lawson. Um, so it's Thursday the 29th and you can register the same way you did for this one at the q and Land Trust website. And yeah, Marsha asks a question. Tara, if you want to say anything about fireflies. Yeah, I, um, I like fireflies a lot. I wish we had more of them in the UP. I grew up in Northern Indiana, so I'm used to the fireflies that make the big J out in all the fields and things like that. And we don't have so many of those around here, um, but the probably the best way to promote them uh, in our region is um, leaving some of that overwintering um, stuff where they are down at the ground, uh, giving them enough time for the, the larvae to emerge. Um, and because they're, the larvae are crawling around at the ground, so leave the leaves down there, um, live, let them have that substrate to go. Um, when you, you're mowing grasses and things like that, leave the grass as tall as you can, or just let, let the grass go as best you can. The, the, you see um, a lot of the, the female fireflies, even in the larvae, they're down at the ground and they're actually signaling down at the ground and, and trying to bring in other insects to their, their light sometimes. It's usually the males that are up flying, looking for, for the females that are down at the ground level. So the more you can do to kind of leave the leaves, leave the grass, um, the best you can help fireflies around here. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tara. And thank you, uh, Bill, for our other speaker. Um, Jill is going to put up some slides. We're going to have a quick update with Connie Prancer on Project Wingspan. Um, for those of you who are really psyched about native plant gardening and collecting. And that will be it for tonight. So thank you so much again, Tara and Bill. Yes, and thank I'll you. I'll turn it over to you, Jill. Here's our first slide, Connie, if you want to talk about this one. All right, well, hello everybody. And thank you so much for having me here to talk about Project Wingspan. 
Um, I'm just going to get my notes so I can stay on track. Um, so Project Wingspan is an eight state pollinator habitat enhancement project. And it's administrated by the Pollinator Partnership and funded by Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Our goal is to increase habitat that will support pollinators, insects in general, and in turn birds. So it's really nice coming after those two speakers because you guys just set the stage for me. Thank you very much. Um, our approach is to collect seed from native flowering plants um, from a target list of species. And the species on our target list provides nectar and pollen and host plants for, um, they were chosen for the monarch butterfly and the rusty patch bumblebee, but they're also um, supportive to many other native pollinators and insects. Each state is divided into bioregions. And for Michigan, that's three bioregions. There's the, um, the lower mitt and the upper mitt and then the UP. And um, seed collected within a bioregion goes back to the bioregion. So it's not shared with other states and it's not shared with other bioregions. My job is to solicit and enlist volunteers to collect seed, find collection sites, and circulate and encourage folks to participate in our habitat survey. So what you see on the screen um, that Maria put, oh no, Jill put up for me is um, how to, information how to um, get on our list to be a potential volunteer and also get on our list to be a potential collection site. Um, and do know that volunteers are trained in the best management practices of native plant seed collection through our webinars. And collection sites are our first priority to get um, seed back or seedlings. And the habitat survey is, and you want to share that one, Jill, the habitat survey is used to find likely projects, and I've heard some projects mentioned on this webinar, um, for seed that we collect or the seedlings that we produce from that seed. Um, I want to say that the lower bioregion, that lower mitt area is rocking. I've got lots of sites. I got lots of volunteers. There was a lot of seed distributed and a lot of seedlings also are, are going to be distributed this May. But I have to say that upper mitt and the UP is not rocking so much. Um, I haven't found a lot of collection sites and um, and I haven't found volunteers, but things are opening up. Um, Susan Troll, I saw your name there. Thank you very much. Um, um, she is a forester at uh, one of the federal forests that opened up for us in the UP. Um, both of them have, and uh, thank you very much. And I was hoping that uh, some of the volunteers, especially the wild ones, um, could get excited about that to collect seed. But I also need um, a lot more collection sites because the more collection sites I have, um, the more seed that will be collected and the more seed that can be redistributed into the UP. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. I wanted to keep it to five minutes. Um, and I want, I know everybody's anxious to go home, but um, do let me put, if I can, I see now, I don't know how to get back to the whole bigger picture. Um, so would somebody type in my, my email for me and then you, you just disappeared all together. Now, I don't know where you are. Um, isn't that interesting? We can still hear you, oh, so good. don't worry. Thank yeah, you. I think you probably just went behind another window. Oh, you you so, um, bless your hearts. Um, so my email, um, if you if you want to just contact me directly, it's cc at pollinator org. 
and that's that's it. Um, it's a I'm 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 excited about the program. I've been at it for this will be my third season, and um, we've got at least two more seasons to collect seed. Great. And, yeah. Any questions? Oh, there you are. Just like that magic. <laughs> Uh, Marsha put Connie's uh, email in the chat there so people can. There I am. I thought I turned this on. So there you go. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. That's a great project and a great need to, for our local people to help fill. And I was excited to see a lot of the species on our target list um, in both presentations. So. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank, thank you again to um, our presenters and to Connie for coming out and for everyone for sticking sticking with us till the end. And so I think we'll just call her good for tonight. But I'll remind you, we are going to um, post the recorded presentations. It will um, probably take us a little bit of time before we, we do that. Um, but then we also have uh, the session next week. So hopefully we'll see you back here then. And uh, happy gardening until next week and happy Earth Day. Good night. Good night, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Good night. <laughs>